Thank you a lot, Mr. Stiller. Um, hello, ladies and gentlemen. I'm very thrilled to present you my work today. I'm with the Daimler Corporation. My uh, supervisor is Dr. Uwe Franke. And our team at Daimler focuses on the 3D perception um, using stereo camera vision. These cameras are mounted to the car behind the windshield and they look in the driving direction of the car. And my outline of this talk will be that I will present you a um, medium level representation that will help other vision tasks to lower, the to lower the computational burden they have when they process stereo images. Let's have a look, Let's have a look at this um, typical traffic scene. What we see is a couple of cars standing in front of us. We don't know if they move, we just can assume they do. We have pedestrians at the side, we have oncoming cars, cars we have um, infrastructure, we have lots of, uh, lots of road markings, we have streets, we have curbs like we just saw in the presentation of uh, Jan Siegemund. And so we have several, several tasks for um, nowadays vision systems that they can detect several objects in the scene. And we have a stereo image pair here, and if you look at the disparity image closely, we see that we have lots and lots of disparity measurements available. And in this disparity image, we have an encoding that green represents distance me measurements that are far away, and rep represent, red represents distance measurements that are close. And we have some areas that could not be matched. This is due to left-right occlusion. These areas cannot be, areas cannot be measured. And coming from correlation-based stereo, where we had sparse features, we now have kind of a luxury problem that the uh, measurements are really, really dense. And for a VGA-sized image, we have over 300,000 disparity, disparity measurements that we have to process. And now let's imagine all these tasks I mentioned before. They have to reprocess the image over and over again, and every task extracts the relevant information independently for himself. So what, what we like to have is a medium-level representation that extracts all the relevant information from the scene in a medium-level representation that could be looking like this. So what we see here is the so-called Stixel representation, which is our contribution to this conference. And objects are approximated by the use of several rectangular slices. Uh, the name is derived from uh, pixel and stick, so it equals to Stixel. And this Stixel um, representation is quite compact, and it, it is quite intuitive. And if we turn it to a 3D view, we can see how the Stixel representation is able to follow the contours of the objects in 3D quite, quite closely. And so when, when we have such a representation a priori to the other tasks, we can imagine that it is quite helpful for other tasks like vehicle trackers or even lane trackers to um, know what they have to expect in the scene so they can reduce the amount of work they have to do to extract all the information by themselves. Another thing that would be really helpful to know is um, how these, how these um, slices are grouped, how they belong together. On the one hand, yes, but more importantly, we want, we want to know how they move, how they move over time. And we don't want to know this for groups, we want to know this for every Stixel independently. So what we want to have is something that looks like this. We, have, we want to have motion information available for every, sig for every single Stixel independently of the neighbor. So my talk will be um, regarding two things, two things. It will be the static Stixel representation, as you see it here. And I will approach to the dynamic sticks representation um, later on. So um, the sticks will assume that we slice the image into equiangular slices of a given width. And as soon as we touch an obstacle in each slice, we compute the obstacle for that. So our sticks world definition is that a sticks has always a vertical pose. It is always touching the ground and it encodes the distance to the first obstacle along each, di along each viewing direction in the image. So by the help of the, um, of the Stixel representation, we try to bridge the gap between low level, meaning pixel-based vision, and high level, meaning object-based object -based vision. And the objects approximate, uh, the Stixels approximate the object by a set of using rectangular slices and they provide the distance and the height information to these obstacles. So everything in front of the Stixel representation, uh, spatial meaning, is uh, regarded as free space. So it is space that is available to, um, to maneuver the car without hitting any obstacle. Now, as I said before, we have several disparity measurements, over 300,000. And every single Stixel, every single, single static Stixel, is given by two parameters only. So this is the height information, and this is the distance information to the Stixel. 
The lateral position itself is encoded in the ordering of all stixels. This is possible due to the fix with the stixel half within the image. So let's assume they have um, a width of five pixels. The relevant information from a VGA-sized image, so from 300,000 disparity measurements, can, re can be reduced in 128 stixels only. And what you see is a representation that will be looking like this. So I want to sketch the um, stixel creation process very briefly. This is part of previous work presented at the German, at the German conference uh, earlier last year. We have a stereo image pair, and we compute um, the disparity image for that. This uh, disparity image is mapped to occupancy grids, and they are separated using a dynamic programming approach, and we are able to compute the free space that we have available to drive the car. Once we have the free space and the end of it, we know where the object starts, and with that information, we are able to extract the height information for every object independently. So with these last two informations available, we can extract the stixel information and use a spatial and use um, an integration over all disparities under the area of the stixel to get a re really precise um, distance refinement for every stixel independently. The applicator has the choice of different width he can use for the stixels. So he can start with um, wide stixels and uh, obtain a very compact representation, or you can uh, tighten things up and get a very precise approximation of the outline of the objects to encounter. I want to show this again. So from very compact to very precise, the user can freely choose the width and therefore adopt the representation to its personal needs. I want to show you, I want to show you how this works on a real sequence. In the sequence, you have the disparity input that is used to generate this representation, and, and, and I want to note that we only use the 3D information here. This is not based on any kind of um, image gray value input. Let's see how it works. So what we see is that the cars entering are approximated quite well. We have infrastructure on the side. This is the first obstacle, the wall. As soon as there is um, space between the walls, we get the next obstacles, which is the houses in this example. So this already really works quite well. And let's see a 3D view of that to get the impression of the quality of the data. So one can imagine that it's already quite a good start for any further task as an input to know what to expect in the scene. But as I said before, this is not where we want to stop. We want to have motion information. And with motion information, we could imagine to have something that looks like this. In, in this scene, we see a bicyclist, and this bicyclist is covered with green stixels. And green means, if you look at the color chart at the side, um, that it moves in a direction that is relatively to our car, and it moves to our lower right side of the, to our front side car, of, uh, to our front side of the, of the ego car. And the saturation the stixel has is um, encoding the speed of the stixel move. And if you look at it very closely, you can see that there are white stixels in the bushes and even in the car, which means that these objects are static. They remain where they are, so they don't move. And in a circle, we have no movement, so it is encoded as white. So what we want to know is, where does the stixel, where does the stixel move? How fast does it move there? And where will it be within the next couple of frames? So will it be a potential dangerous obstacle for us? And to estimate this kind of information, we rely upon uh, the use of external comet filters. We have the nonlinear measurement we have the nonlinear measurement model-based uh, pinhole general geometry, and we have the linear system model with the state information um, consisting of the longitudinal position and the speed and the lateral position and the speed as well. So in order to track the stixels over time, we are not registering stixels above each other, but we're using other input methods and we use the static stixel representation as I showed you earlier. We're using the disparity images and we're using the optical flow images, which encode the displacement from pixels from one time step into another time step. And we also use the ego motion information that is obtained by inertial sensors. Now I want to briefly sketch the tracking process in a bit more detail. Uh, we take the old position of a dynamic stixel in row, and we have to um, extract the disparity measurement and the new column measurement for that. So let's assume this is the old stixel position, and we have several flow vectors leaving that area, and we extract a generalized 
flow measurement in a, in a, horizontal, compo uh, in a horizontal component for that. And so we can displace the stixel to its new position. And at this new position, we grab into the disparity image and extract the new disparity measurements for the stixel. So what we obtain is a couple, a disparity measurement, and a column measurement to update the external Kalman filter. Additionally, we try to associate all static stixels to the dynamic stixels. And if a static stixel cannot be associated, we create a new dynamic stixel for that, for that static stixel. So this is the birth process for the dynamic stixels. Further on, we, if the matching is really, really good, we use the height information of the static stixel to update, to update the height information of the dynamic stixel, so we don't need any further height segmentation, which, which would be computationally very expensive. So let's see how this works. Once again, we have the um, stereo input at the top right. We have the optical flow input on the top left. And let me remind you, let me remind you that this is a color scheme, so white means the objects are standing still, and purple would mean that an object is moving to the, to the right in the scene, relatively to our car. And what we will see is a motorcycle entering from the right side in this, into the sequence. And let's see how this looks. Okay, so there was a motorcycle, and if you could look closely, you, already, you also saw the arrows on the bottom, which indicated the movement direction, and they all looked very alike, and even the color scheme was very alike, so there were no, no uh, different coloring, no uncertainties. So this really is quite, quite um, a high quality of information we have here. And let's, let's look at the bicyclist we saw once before again. Once again, these obstacles remain still, they don't move and we see the bicycle, and we go to a 3D view where the bicycle is standing, and let's look at the arrows at the bottom, how they point in the direction homogeneously, very homogeneously, and how the stixels approximate the bicycle very well. So this is, I think, quite impressive, and if you, f if you proceed to another sequence, this sequence will feature a couple of trucks taking a left turn at an intersection. And the truck is quite long and it is not rigid. And this um, property of not being rigid is being visualized by a different color encoding the stixel will have over, over time while the, truck, while the truck is taking that left turn. So the driver's cabin will move in a different direction than the rear does. And let's have a look at that. So it starts with purple because it's going to the left, uh, to the, yeah, to the left, and then it will turn yellow because it is approaching our direction, or relatively to our direction. So we can see that here the driver's cabin is yellow, while the rear is still, is still purple. So we can actually derive rotation information for other objects, even with that representation. Oh, speaking about the computational effort, we had this earlier before with Jan Siegemund. This uh, approach is totally real-time capable with a, a common 3 gigahertz quad-core CPU for VGA-sized images. We have um, a vision, we have a rate of about 25 frame, frames per second, and the dense semi-global matching algorithm is computed on, dedica on dedicated FPGA hardware, which is um, plugged into the PCI bus. And the optical flow is computed either on an FPGA as well, or it is uh, computed on a GPA implementation using, using the CUDA language. So let me, let me summarize my talk. Um, what I introduced was, um, on the first part, the static sticks representation to extract um, objects in a very compact matter. And we extended that representation with motion information. And I showed you on some examples that the motion information is quite reliable and quite expressive. And well, that quite summarizes all my talk. And I thank you very much for your attention. <laughs>